bordered by Iran to the west, Pakistan and China to the east and south, and states that were once part of Russia to the north, Afghanistan lies at the heart of a region that has long been an arena of imperial rivalry. Following in the footsteps of Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan, the British launched military campaigns in Afghanistan from bases in India. Their strategic goal was to thwart Russian and Persian advances in the region. They finally conquered Afghanistan in 1879, installed a compliant monarchy, and established the Durand Line, an arbitrary boundary between eastern Afghanistan and what was later to become Pakistan. But in 1919, the successor to the Afghan monarch drove out the war-weary British. During the 1920s, King Amanullah Khan promoted a more modern and secular society in Afghanistan. But pushback from tribal leaders led to his overthrow in 1929. However, the power of the monarchy was quickly restored by his cousin, who resumed modernization at a more moderate pace. During the period from the 1930s to the 1960s, the resilient Khan family dynasty, despite the occasional assassination, gradually continued with political reforms, which gave rise to numerous parties and factions, many with ties to the Soviet Union. Finally, in 1973, the monarchy was abolished in a non-violent coup by former Prime Minister Mohammad Daoud, and a republic was established. But efforts at further democratic development were undermined by economic instability, leading to the takeover by a military coup of the Soviet-aligned factions of the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, PDPA, in 1978. In 1979, the Marxist PDPA launched a campaign of radical modernization, overturning all religious laws and aggressively promoting women's rights and land reform while jailing and executing its political opponents. As might be expected, these measures prompted a major revolt, especially in rural areas, and heralded the rise of radical Islamism as a force in Afghanistan. In 1979, the Soviet Union staged a military intervention to come to the aid of the embattled government in Afghanistan. At the same time, the United States saw an opportunity to score a victory in the Cold War. The CIA engaged the Pakistani's Army Intelligence Service, ISI, in a covert program to arm and train an Islamic guerrilla force, the Mujahideen, to fight the Afghan army and its Soviet allies. This program, initiated under Jimmy Carter, was expanded under the administration of Ronald Reagan in 1980 and continued into the Bush senior administration. It was this covert operation, sponsored by the US and Saudi Arabia, that ultimately gave rise to both the Taliban and Al Qaeda. Unable to prevail against a hostile population and a persistent guerrilla force, the Soviets under President Gorbachev withdrew in 1989, shortly before the collapse of the USSR. But the government of Babrak Kamal held on until 1992, when an interim Islamic State of Afghanistan was declared. In the chaos that followed, the Pakistani-backed Taliban emerged victorious over the warlords of the Northern Alliance and the more liberal United Front in a bloody struggle that ended in 1996. In their brutal way, the Taliban restored a measure of order to Afghanistan and attempted to curtail the illegal production of opium, which still remains the mainstay of the Afghan economy. Meanwhile, the radical Islamist organization, Al-Qaeda, under the leadership of Saudi billionaire Osama bin Laden, had established a base in a remote area of Afghanistan bordering Pakistan, and it was from here that Al-Qaeda's plans to attack U.S. interests were launched. Four coordinated suicide attacks on September 11, 2001, shocked the world. The perpetrators were soon identified as a group of 19 men, mostly Saudi Arabians, who were organized and funded by Al-Qaeda, 
which was then headquartered in Afghanistan. Understandably, these events triggered a frenzy of American nationalism and a thirst for revenge. The United States demanded that the Al-Qaeda leadership be handed over while at the same time preparing for war. Even though the Taliban agreed to surrender bin Laden subject to proof of guilt, a war was launched anyway, only 27 days after the attacks on New York and Washington. The U.S. goal was not only the elimination of Al-Qaeda and the removal of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, but more broadly a military campaign against terrorism anywhere in the world, and in particular, Islamic terrorism. Underlying these actions was an ideology known as neoconservatism, which was represented by powerful factions in the U.S. foreign policy establishment. Since the end of the Cold War, their ambition had been to replace what were seen as backward regimes throughout the oil-rich Southwest Asian region with modern, democratic, U.S.-friendly governments. The U.S. war in Afghanistan, waged mainly from the air in coordination with limited ground forces, seemed at first successful. The Taliban, overwhelmed by the U.S.-backed Northern Alliance, were soon toppled from power. Many people suspected of being terrorists were rounded up, some were detained and tortured, but the Al-Qaeda leadership remained elusive. In 2002, a new government was installed in Kabul, headed by Hamid Karzai, and for two years the defeated Taliban lay dormant while the U.S. and its NATO allies embarked on a campaign of economic aid and social reform, promoting education and women's rights. But when the U.S. attention was focused elsewhere, in Iraq, a resurgent Taliban saw an opportunity to stage a guerrilla campaign against the U.S. occupation and the increasingly unpopular government in Kabul. It was this seeming neglect of the war in Afghanistan that emerged as an issue in the 2008 election, when candidate Barack Obama promised to end the war in Iraq while redoubling U.S. efforts in Afghanistan. And in 2009, as the situation in Afghanistan failed to improve, Obama, now president, ordered a troop increase. For six years, Afghanistan has been denied the resources that it demands because of the war in Iraq. Now we must make a commitment that can accomplish our goals. I've already ordered the deployment of 17,000 troops that had been requested by General McKiernan for many months. But this change of tactics did not reach the heart of the problem because a foreign army occupying a Muslim country did not sit well with a populace that had previously rejected similar interventions. And when bin Laden was discovered and killed in Pakistan, enthusiasm for the 10-year-old war began to fade, together with the fervor to avenge 9-11. But a series of events in the spring of 2012 so enraged the Afghans that even the Karzai government was calling for an immediate U.S. withdrawal. And in America, support for the war from across the political spectrum began to crumble. Step by step, uh, bloody step by step, the U.S. will withdraw most or all of its forces from Afghanistan by 2014. The, uh, the parallel is uh, that uh, Obama uh, has, has made a decision to withdraw in stages uh, as as uh, ha happened, you'll see, in Iraq. Um, the, in the first stage, uh, the military didn't get what he wanted. What the, what the generals didn't get what they wanted. Um, uh, Obama decided on 33,000. And right away, some people on the left said, but that's nothing because he put in 33,000. Now he's withdrawing them. I look at it as I have a different sense of math. Uh, even if he put in 33,000, the withdrawal of the 33,000 is not 
nothing. It's 33,000 less. It, it, leave, it leaves um, 68,000 more to go. Uh, and it sets, it set, sets a, a dynamic that increases the, ten, the desire of the public in our NATO uh, countries, Canada, Germany, England, and so on, to, to get, look for the exits more quickly. It also um, sets in motion a dynamic, an interesting dynamic, uh, with uh, the regime that we support so fully in uh, Kabul. They get the message that the Americans are leaving and it, it, uh, it, it creates an unknown set of uh, conditions. One is panic, two is disbelief, three is, um, re you know, searching for uh, allies to renegotiate and stop Obama. And there also will be um, a desire on the part of uh, the Afghan government growing to uh, negotiate the best deal they can before the Americans leave. But to this could be added another thing. I think U.S. is sick and tired of fighting poor peasant marginal populations in small villages, be that in Vietnam, in Iraq, or in Afghanistan. Or in big parts of Libya, big parts of Somalia, and so on. Because what they obtain is that they attack somebody who's shooting at them. And then that somebody disperses into the wilderness, into the desert, or into an urban jungle, and it's impossible to get hold of. And this can go on for years, years and years. Now, those people will have difficulty conquering a town let us say Kabul, once the Americans leave. Because the Afghan National Army, whatever is left of it, will probably defend the town. In order to conquer that one, you cannot disperse into the desert. You have somehow to get into the town. Now, the Vietnamese were good at that. They were digging down tunnels, for instance. Very good at it. Well, the Taliban are equally good, I don't know. But what I think Pentagon is longing for is a War with somebody big, somebody their own size, not some poor, godforsaken farmers, but something like China, Russia, where you can use big, big weapons and have big, big battles, and that where they could show their technical superiority, because all their so-called technical superiority has come to nothing relative to IED, improvised explosive devices, ten dollars a piece much more efficient than an aircraft carrier, it seems. So what a shame, and they are ashamed, and they're probably longing for a different type of war. They care fundamentally about protecting the reputation of the United States uh, and cannot be seen as being weak uh, on defense or defeated, quote unquote, or losing uh, Afghanistan to the Taliban. And that, that tendency to be uh, overly concerned about our reputation worsens our reputation because it allows for the perpetuation of the war, torture, dungeons, all kinds of terrible things. Uh, and it also um, may not put off a day of reckoning but it requires them to look for a way to cover up a retreat if they have to retreat. My business is to try to take that into account and advocate forms of redeployment, as they say, since retreat is apparently unacceptable, uh, because I, I know that, that wars uh, end in, in uh, compromise uh, outcomes and you can't trust our diplomats to, to see a peace offer for what it is and take it because they're worried about their reputation. It's that simple. So what I have said now, there may be an exit strategy if they don't trust it. Secondly, there is certainly not a no-to-war strategy. 
There is even a stepping up and it's a change of the type of war. Um, Iran has an indirect alliance to China and Russia and on the, through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Attack Iran and you may gain to more than you have asked for. But maybe the Pentagon would like to have it. Because they have had, let us say, a strategy for conquering Russia and conquering China a long time ago. In that strategy, we'll probably find some nuclear weapons at work. Now, Newt Gingrich might fight that war. Whether Obama will also do it, I don't know. But um, when I watch what he has been doing, I, um, I don't trust any single word he says, and he could possibly do that too. He has a category called necessary war. And according to him, Iraq was unnecessary, whereas Afghanistan is necessary. Well, if it is necessary, you wouldn't exit without some kind of victory, and there has been no victory, as we know. Um, that can be obtained by negotiation. I mean, if these people had a minimum of sanity, they would join a conference for security and cooperation in Central Asia. Even be happy to be observers, because it might be that Central Asian countries would be disinclined to invite Britain. And they might even understand that maybe this whole issue is better left to others than themselves. Now, on the other side, the Taliban, uh, and I use the term for a very broad uh, network of insurgent groups, uh, the Taliban and their friends in Pakistan will uh, 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 perhaps overestimate their success and they could they could uh, make a, a mistake by going too far, by setting their sights on the overthrow of the Kabul government and marching into Kabul to put up a Taliban government. What's wrong with that scenario is that the Taliban really are popular only in the south and east of Afghanistan because they're Pashtun people, 42% of the population, also southern Pakistan. Their enemies among the Tajik, who are 27% of the population, are the same enemies they had in the, in the, the war a decade ago that ended in a, a bloodbath uh, between the Northern Alliance and the Taliban. So uh, I think it's most unlikely that this Afghanistan will end in a uh, Taliban takeover, as they say. For one reason, the United States will, will oppose that, and so will the Europeans. Um, it's, it's more possible that the civil war could resume. That would make it harder to get out. Um, so that leaves a kind of a partition or a territorial compromise with a power-sharing arrangement and uh, supervision, um, and peacekeeping by troops from countries that have not been engaged on either side. There are Islamic countries who are not engaged. Um, sounds uh, bizarre. Well, uh, uh, something like the same happened in the Dayton negotiations about Bosnia, and uh, it could happen again. Um, it, it, what is peculiar about this is uh, going back to uh, Iraq. In Iraq, the United States helped Iran, the interests of Iran. If you put a Shia government into power in Iraq, you're helping Iran. Okay? In Afghanistan, Afghanistan it is the opposite. In Afghanistan, Iran uh, has enormous hostility towards the Taliban. They've had violent uh, frictions. The Taliban uh, represents Sunni, not the interests of Iran. Iran was on the same side as the United States a decade ago with the um, the Northern Alliance. Uh, Iran has another interest in uh, Afghanistan, which is all the opium uh, flows 
out of Afghanistan, over the border with Iran, uh, it, there's a, an, an enormous opium addiction problem in Iran as a result, not to mention Europe. Tens of thousands of people overdose on that, uh, that substance. So the United States should make a coalition with Iran over getting out of Afghanistan uh, and with Pakistan. Maybe it will. Uh, maybe you'll have no choice. Uh, but, uh, but what people have to understand is the U.S. has a, has a, uh, a, a coalition with India, which is a Hindu-dominated state. And the reason for that, I think, is that the United States wants to partner against China but in making a partner of India, it brings out the hostility from Pakistan and from Afghanistan who don't want India to become the police power or the economic power over the future of Afghanistan. The Pashtuns uh, divided between Afghanistan and Pakistan by the so-called Iran line drawn by the British imperialists. And this line is absolutely basic to the whole issue because the Pashtuns are, according to the data I got, the biggest national minority in the world without their own state, 40 million people. There are lots of nations that are overshadowed by dominant nations in the state system of the world, but this one is sizable. Now, the Taliban, as they are appointed enemies of the United States, uh, partly a creation of U.S. imagination, since Talib means a student of the Quran, and there are many of those in Muslim countries, are to a large extent Pashtuns. That they have found in Afghanistan and in Pakistan is not exactly uh, astounding to anybody except to persons who read maps only by the color of the states and think they are homogeneous in sight. If they had maps that showed nations, and you could even imagine, you see, maps where suddenly the state borders decrease in salience and the nation borders come up and then you switch something and it goes the other way again they would have understood much more of the geopolitics of the case. So for the Pashtun, he's not crossing a border when he goes from Afghanistan to Pakistan, he's inside his own lands. And it's ridiculous to assume that he should respect the Duran line, because uh, that was drawn according to a very strange principle, and it was essentially an imperial construction. Now, sorry for this long introduction, but the point is this. You will solve nothing unless that line becomes less important. There has to be some kind of unification of the Pashtun. Uh, not a day goes by when I don't spend hours reading, reflecting, thinking, doing, talking, teaching, writing about these wars since they began. And in the course of this, I discovered that there's an actual doctrine that I would say uh, Obama is, is quietly opposing, but it's a doctrine held by the um, many in the counterinsurgency community and in the Pentagon. And it's, it's, an, it's an actual doctrine called the Long War. Um, and it's, uh, um, it's to our credit that it's been, keep, it's been kept so secret from the American people. But in essence, after 9-11, uh, about 2004, the doctrine uh, began to get legs uh, and find its way into journals of military experts called the Long War Journal, for example. You can look it up the speeches of uh, American generals, um, 
the, uh, it infected the uh, vocabulary of the neoconservatives. Um, and in essence, it says, we will fight this war against terrorism, against Muslim fundamentalists, wherever they are across the world, for 50 years to 80 years. Uh, and, 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 and wars like Iraq are episodes. Um, they're, they're small wars within the context of the, the long war, according to the title of one of these books. Uh, and uh, the reason this has to be hidden, as you can imagine, is that uh, it, would, it would probably end the apathy of many young people, students, because there's no draft. They're not primarily engaged in the subject. But if they learned that there was going to be an 80-year period of consecutive war, and it was going to be financed by them because it's not coming out of current tax dollars, and they looked at the casualties, they would wake up. Uh, no American voter in their right mind, and I know there are many who may not be in their right mind, would support an 80-year war or a 50-year war if the current cost of uh, Iraq alone is uh, in the millions, you're talking about, I mean trillions, you're looking at, at a cost of these wars that's in the many, many trillions if they go on for 50 years. 50 years, 80 years is 20 presidential terms. Uh, people, somebody who may not uh, be born or may not be out of high school will become president before this is over if these neoconservatives have their way. So I, I became quite startled and I came to the, the conclusion that uh, obviously we can't afford in any sense an unfunded, unwinnable, multi-trillion dollar war that claims thousands of lives and it hangs like a shadow over our future. And that's the reason that they're keeping it so quiet to themselves.